Welcome to the No Unfinished Business Podcast. There are a thousand different ways your clients can leave unfinished business, but no single advisor can address every issue. In every episode, we'll answer the important questions to help professional advisors focused on individual clients, attorneys, CPAs, and financial advisors, identify and eliminate those planning blind spots so you can speak competently and confidently to your clients and help them leave no unfinished business. Hey, Tamma, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate it. Sure. So, Tamma, you're the second interview in our insurance series. I heard you speak a few weeks ago about life settlements, and I'd always kind of thought, well, what do you do with these whole life policies, these permanent insurance policies, if they don't make sense anymore? Obviously, we can trade them in for the cash value. But you've got a different idea that kind of looks like that rather than try and mangle my way through the description. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. So so by way of background, I just want to say um, to the audiences, I'm like John, I'm an estate planning attorney, and I've been doing this for, for uh, 23 years. And uh, in connection with that, I, I'm a big believer in life insurance. I think life insurance can solve complex problems in a very straightforward manner. So our clients have life insurance. They come to us, they already have it. Sometimes they come to us and we identify a need for life insurance. And and so what is that need? Um, so various things, um, income replacement is straightforward, right? Somebody just wants to have in, uh, income replacement to support their family, support a spouse, um, additional savings if we've got you know income replacement plus needs to go ahead and educate kids. So pretty straightforward. Then you have a client who's a wealthier client. So why do wealthy people need life insurance? So wealthy people use life insurance for liquidity, um, liquidity for estate taxes. So people oftentimes know that insurance passes uh, income tax-free, but is not estate tax-free unless it's properly structured in the type of trust that John, you, or I would, would establish for the client. And then there's some other thoughts about it. Key man insurance, right? We've got somebody who's a key man in a company. There's a lot of value tied up with that key man. We wanna ensure that single life risk and could be a loss to the company or there is tax efficient type of income diversification and growth. In the state of Texas, our audience here may not know that life insurance, all of the cash value and all of the death benefit is protected from creditor claims. So it's interesting, I've got young doctor group of clients that come to me. A lot of them will come with a lot of cash value insurance. So our wealthy clients have insurance and, and we've known that. And I had never really heard about the life settlement market until 2017 when I had a new client who was a beneficiary of an insurance trust and his grandfather was no longer making gifts to the trust to maintain the insurance. The grandfather was 94 years old and had a 20 year younger second wife. It was this younger second wife who wasn't a beneficiary of the insurance trust who really didn't want to see large premium payments going to maintain this insurance. And when I reached out to uh, one of the gentlemen who's now one of my partners in the life settlement space and said, oh my gosh, what can they do? They had just let four and a half million dollars of insurance lapse on a 94 year old and there's only three million left. That was the person who for the first time told me that life insurance is an asset that can be sold. And so that's what we're here to talk about today. It's the life settlement market. And that's the opportunity to go ahead and sell a life insurance policy in the secondary market to an institutional investor for an amount that is more than the cash surrender value, but less than the death benefit. And that's the option that a lot of people don't know about. Yeah, and I mean, obviously there are a bunch of questions that come in. Knowing that one of the basic rules for taxes on a life insurance policy, you know, there are a lot of ways the transfer for value rules will come in and ruin that income tax-free return. But if this is an institutional investor, they're already expecting to get income tax or income that is subject to income tax. So the fact that they're going to have to pay income tax on the difference between the basis and the, the amount received isn't really a big deal for them. Right. That, that's the issue at the fund investor level. So if you're investing in the fund, you're going to want to understand your tax treatment as an investor. So those are the purchasers in this market. They're institutional investors. Who are they? There are a lot of the, the household names in the fund space. KKR, TPG, Apollo, 
Blackstone. There are some funds that are really specific to the settlement space. Um, Berkshire Hathaway has been an investor in the space. McKinsey has been an investor, Corey Capital. So a lot of Wall Street capital. And those are the buyers. And so some of those buyers, Vita Capital, large fund that's out of Austin. Actually, one of my partners was one of the founders of, of that fund, which grew out of a, a family office group um, to become a very large buyer in the space. And so, um, but in any event, they're, they're sort of addressing the income tax consequences to their investors, right? So that's an investor side. From our perspective, um, they're looking to go ahead and acquire these contracts for as little as possible. So in I have my estate planning practice and I also have a life settlement business. And in that business, we're looking to advise clients on how to extract the maximum amount of value. So you have the purchaser side and that's being fueled by institutional capital that's really flowed into the market um, and, and it's significant in recent years. And one of the reasons is that low interest rates have been um, very, very challenging for insurance carriers. And so what are insurance carriers able to do under a lot of these contracts? They're actually able to pull some levers and increase the cost of that insurance. And so if the insurance gets more expensive, then that's something that makes it more costly for the policyholder to go ahead and maintain the contract. And so people are are looking at this as something that's more expensive. Now on the investor side, they've had lower cost of capital, prolonged low interest rates on the investor side makes alternatives to this, what is a more safe type of fixed income like investment. The hurdle rates, what I need to go ahead and return to my investors is also lower because the, the, the risk free rate is really low. And so what it's done is it's actually made the competition and the pricing for these contracts higher. So there's a lot of capital flowing into the market, chasing uncorrelated asset classes. And what they really need are for clients to know about this market and be willing to sell their life insurance. That's interesting. And just to kind of sum up what you just said, even though the life insurance companies are pulling the levers to raise the cost of insurance, the buyers, those institutional buyers, they enjoy, they appreciate that and it's actually a benefit to them you know not that they don't want to lose money or have the costs go up but it's less of a sting for them is that about right no no it's still a sting for them but it's made the cost of maintaining the policy more expensive right so if mm -hmm. here i am i'm a policy owner and i want to maintain this coverage but the costs are just increasing and and i just want to go back to one point about life insurance so in, in estate planning and, and then i'll answer the question so Wealthy people buy life insurance. They buy it to for the reasons that we discussed generally. But when we have really wealthy clients, wealthy clients oftentimes use life insurance as a hedge against an early death. So mm -hmm. John, when you and I help somebody and advise somebody in a more sophisticated estate planning strategy, it really relies on the donor, somebody who's engaged in the transaction, to live for some period of time. So the assets that were transferred, whether by gift, by sale, or by both, can appreciate outside of the taxable estate. So life insurance will pay once you pay that first premium payment. And so if we're thinking about, well, in order to achieve this result, we need our donor to live for 10, 15, 20 years, and this is what it will look like then, but we've got this tax issue today, our life insurance is able to address that today. So I think of life insurance for the wealthiest clients, again, even when there is sufficient liquidity for estate taxes and they're looking to invest in, in, in an insurance product is a diversified investment and a hedge against an early death. Right. And so now what happens as this contract matures, well, maybe it wasn't a guaranteed contract. So if a guaranteed contract is there, then we're not worried about these levers that the insurance company can pull. But now maybe the need for the insurance no longer exists because the other transfers that were made, other estate planning transfer tax techniques have matured. And now this life insurance is actually getting very, very expensive. Why? Because we didn't pay into a guaranteed contract. We funded it, maybe minimally funded it, and we knew we were going to get these big catch-up payments. So we've invested this amount and we don't want to continue it. So now the institutional purchaser comes in and they're willing to pay some value today and they also know and understand how to more optimally fund the contract. In addition, they don't have a single life risk, right? So when I just have a single or maybe we have a survivor policy, I'm looking at just one or two lives here. Whereas if I'm an institutional investor, I have a diversified portfolio of lives. So I am not as concerned about one life. Some, pe some, some people die early. Some people live to life expectancy. Some people live beyond. But what is clear about the wealthiest clients is 
wealthy clients live statistically significantly longer than less wealthy clients. So the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the United States, and, and that's actually not, not generally the clients that maybe you and I are working with. We're probably working with clients at a slightly higher level of wealth. But let's just talk about that, that top 10%. Their life expectancy, if, if a man or woman has lived to the age 55, life expectancy for men and women is actually identical, and it's at age 90. And that's a 50% chance of living longer than age 90. So if somebody's gone ahead and funded an insurance contract, and they funded it because they thought, you know, for sure one or both of us is going to die before 85 or 86. If we look at the IRS mortality tables, it's going to tell us that's 84 or so. Um, so we funded it very minimally, and now... We have one or two lives that are, you know, at age 90 with a life expectancy. We have an 89-year-old client with a, a nine-year life expectancy. That's a 50% chance of living longer than 98 years of age. So that's an important part of the life settlement market because if the use of the insurance has, has really sort of ceased to be important, and now it's very expensive to maintain, at some point you're sort of, you have this crossover point where you're trading money with the insurance company or worse, coming out of pocket. So where does the institutional customer investor come in? Well, they're actually approaching this funding from a different perspective because they have a diversified portfolio of lives and because the way that they can choose to fund the contract is, is just more optimal. They have, they have the ability to go ahead and, and optimize the premium payments in a way that's different from somebody who has just a greater single life risk. Right. And, uh, or, or double life risk. The, right. There, there's a lot in there and I'm going to walk away with, it makes sense for them as an institutional investor that I, as the individual investor, those are just problems and ways of thinking that, you know, I just don't have to concern myself with. That's right. I mean, there, so, so, but, but, but I do want to underscore that, that carriers, there, there are carriers that are, that are riskier carriers. And that's going to, that's going to, that's going to involve the price that the institutional purchaser is, is willing to go ahead and pay. So if there's a carrier that's demonstrated a willingness to go ahead and increase costs of insurance, those are the carriers that are going to have greater carrier risk, and that's going to result in a lower purchase price. Again, that's the same thing that the seller is looking at, right? I know I've got a greater carrier risk. I know I'm not going to be able to go ahead and keep continue minimally funding or paying this flat premium. If I don't start ramping it up pretty soon, my insurance policy is going to lapse. So again, those are those are the um, you know that's going to affect the value of the contract and how the purchaser is going to approach the transaction. Got it. Uh, kind of a somewhat related, but taking us in a different direction for now. One of the things that I would kind of assume is, well, the seller, if they've got this policy and it sticks around, you know, obviously somebody's buying it, that is total insurance on their, their body. While it would affect their ability to get insurance down the line, are we, it seems like, well, if they're selling the policy, they probably don't care so much about future insurable needs. Right. right. I, and, and that's important. And that's a point that's that's actually disclosed. And so there's there's life settlement regulations that have been adopted. Forty three out of 50 states have have regulation around life settlements. And there are there are about five other states that have it specifically for viaticals. And just want to talk a minute about viaticals. Viaticals are for persons that are expected to die within 24 months. And so most people at this point in time are aren't concerned, it is disclosed and it's part of the life settlement regulations that it's in, that, that you need to disclose a, a lot of information to the purchaser, which is important. We want the purchaser to be well represented and understand the transaction. And you point out, yes, they can't get more insurance. Um, uh, you know, again, they might be able to get more insurance, but this is going to be part of their insurability that's taken out um, and, and that's encompassed in these existing policies. Uh, there are people that look to go ahead and sell policies and purchase new policies. Sometimes it's on their own lives because there's still in, in, in insurable risk that's there. There's still capacity for insurance. Or sometimes people go ahead and sell a policy on G1, for example, and use the proceeds to go ahead and purchase policies on G2. Um, and so, again, there's lots of ways that that this is something that can be used as part of, you know, it creates liquidity, whether it's liquidity for buying new insurance on different persons, on the same person because it's more efficient than a 1035 type of exchange, or it's just liquidity that's being used to do something else. Different types of investments can serve as a player in one of our estate planning transactions now because we have real liquidity. So what it does is it creates liquidity. Got it. So kind of start wrapping things up. It's still going to be a big question. Kind of putting it two ways. What does the process look like? And 
or alternatively, if the life insurance company is going to give you just a cash, you know, your cash back, why, but, you know, Tamma, why do we need you? Why can't we just do this ourselves? Right. And so that's a good question. So there's been a lot of studies about lapses um, and life insurance and, uh, and permanent insurance. So I'm going to go back to um, when we're looking at insurance for death benefit, we're, we're, we're looking for this to be a permanent product and permanent is a little bit of a misnomer. The type of policies that are usually purchased, you mentioned whole life in, in the introduction, but, but whole life is oftentimes not a real candidate for life settlement because the cash value is actually designed to increase over the life of the contract. Again, assuming that there are withdrawals and it's being used um, in, in that manner. But, but universal life is the type of, of insurance that's most commonly used in permanent estate planning, index universal, variable universal, lots of types of universal um, uh, life insurance. Universal life insurance is actually allowed to lapse or cashed in for the cash surrender value. 88% of all contracts written, written will never pay a death benefit. So that means they're either lapsed, a zero return, or <laughs> somebody's taking the cash surrender value. The statistics in a life settlement transaction are generally around four times what you will receive in a life settlement transaction is generally about four times the cash value. Now that's going to depend widely on the type of contract and, and so forth. So, but if a, a policy qualifies for a life settlement, you will receive more than the cash surrender value. So that's why somebody, again, if the policy qualifies for a life settlement, I want to talk about the buy box and what that looks like, you will get more than the cash surrender value. And so that's the number one thing that most people don't know about. Why are they cashing the policy in if it would qualify for a life settlement? Because they don't know. And there's another statistic that really supports that. So every year, half a million life insurance policies, universal life policies that would have qualified for a life settlement transaction are actually lapsed or surrendered when they would have qualified for the life settlement transaction. And in 2021, less than 3,000 policies transacted in the life settlement secondary market. That means 497,000 people in 2021 would have had a better financial outcome with a life settlement. And the only reason why this is happening and why I greatly appreciate being invited on your podcast today is because people don't know about this. The clients don't know about it. The advisors don't know about it. The attorneys, the accountants, I'm having conversations just like this, just like the presentation that you were at all over the country to really create education and awareness. And so you asked about how do you approach the market? Well, so there's they're direct to consumer purchasers, and you'll see them on the on the TV. You'll hear them on on radio, um, Fox News, CNBC. You choose your news station, um, CNBC in the morning. There's a lot of direct to consumer marketing, and it's important to know that those direct to consumer purchasers do not represent the seller. They have no fiduciary duty to go ahead and offer a fair market value to offer a best price. They represent the investor. They're called life settlement providers. They might represent one of their affiliated companies or an unaffiliated company. But the person they don't represent is the seller. And some of those commercials can seem a little bit um, confusing because they talk about helping you sell your policy. But their help is, again, they're providing liquidity, but they're not providing you with information and market information. So if you have something to sell and there's a very thin market, you can go to one purchaser. So what is that purchaser's incentive to give you a best price? Well, instead, what if you go to the purchasers that are the appropriate purchasers for the type of policy that you're selling and you work with somebody who's really knowledgeable in the space like our firm? So one of my part, two of my partners have combined um, almost, I, I think it's close to 60 years of life insurance expertise between um, my partner, Larry Cashler and Daniel Zeppelin. My other partner, Clay Gibson, actually is one of the founders of Vita Capital. So we have a lot of information on the buy side. We understand how the investor approaches the contract and how they value it. And then, of course, we have my experience um, at the highest end working um, with high net worth, ultra and high net worth clients on the planning side for over two decades. So, so that's kind of the difference about our client, uh, our, our, I'm sorry, our firm. But the real, the real message is the direct to consumer purchase will never yield the best result as an auction process where the right buyers are contacted 
and they're and they are engaged properly with the right type of counselor that's able to go ahead and extract the best value from the market. And we have lots of different um, examples. One of the case studies that you saw when we were together um, at the presentation sort of illustrates how beneficial competition is. And it's not just a little, it's a lot. Yeah, Pam, I think this is probably a great place for us to cut things off. I know we could go for probably hours longer. If our listeners are looking to reach out to you to figure out what their options may be for themselves or for their clients, where can they get in touch with you? Yes. Yeah, so um, I will go ahead and, and give you some information that you can share in the notes. Um, our uh, life settlement business is Trayled Life Settlements. It's uh, trayledls.com. And I will also share that in the notes. And, and the buy box, I just want to mention generally, um, is persons that are over age 70 or younger with a health impairment. Lots of different types of insurance qualify. Term insurance can even qualify. So I guess my what I leave the 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 audience with is you shouldn't allow an insurance policy to lapse without confirming whether or not it could qualify for a life settlement. My firm can very quickly tell somebody a thumbs up or a thumbs down. If it's a thumbs up, then we can start working through a process and it can be fairly efficient. Um, it doesn't have to last forever. We can close transactions within 60 days and get to a really great outcome for the client, which is the goal. You know, the client wins. Um, but our goal is to really get advisors to the wealthiest clients talking about life insurance, even if you didn't sell it, even if it's a plan like you and I, John, have put in place, you know, maybe years ago to ask the client about the life insurance that was in that trust. Is it still working out? Um, encouraging the dialogue can really go ahead and add a significant amount of value to the client. Excellent. Tama, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was really terrific. I really appreciate it.